Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. Uh, firstly, I did just want to say thank you to the Australian Christian Lobby for having me. I really feel honoured that I get to stand on this platform, your platform, and share my story. And uh, the more that I meet the staff from the Australian Christian Lobby, the more I fall in love with them. So I'm just so thankful to be here. They are absolutely lovely and wonderful people. So... I don't know if you've noticed, but our culture in this point in history is completely obsessed with identity. What is identity? What is my identity? What is your identity? How is my identity group constructed? Where does it fit in? Where is it excluded? How have I oppressed you? How have you oppressed me? And it goes on and on and on and on. But above all of this, what we hear about identity is that my identity is mine to define. And I can change it any day. It doesn't have to be backed up by any scientific fact or reality. We are free to define our identities any which way we want, right? And why? Why do we place so much emphasis on identity? I believe it's driven by a deep-seated desire and longing to find significance. And this desire to find significance stems from an urge to be recognised as worthy. But if you are not satisfying that urge by being recognised as one of God's created, loved and valued children, then where do you find that satisfaction? So let me ask you a question. It's the only question that matters when it comes to identity. Who does God say you are? Speaking of identity, it's a good time to tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm an artist, curator and writer. I've been making art for about 12 years. I use photography, video and installation and I use them and a creative kind of art strategy to unearth tensions that arise in me in a, in a cathartic way. I make art that traverses the line between the self, the cultural and the political, and it often taps into social and political discourse, especially taboo or controversial ideas. It has at times moved out of the gallery and into the public realm. So I've had work on tram, on trams, on billboards, I've had public commissions, and my work often goes into the mass media. It's in every major institutional collection in this country, and in the last 12 years, I've had 26 solo exhibitions and been in over 60 group exhibitions. I've, short, I've been shortlisted for 18 art prizes and I've won or placed in six. I'm also doing a PhD at Deakin University and my PhD asks how can art be used to reframe the self and the audience when it comes to uncomfortable, controversial or taboo topics. So I'm basically doing a PhD on myself. <laughs> which is the best way to do one. Uh, I'm married to my perfect man. This is my husband and I, and he's here. And we are holding the thing that we love most in this world, which is coffee, clearly. And the reason we love coffee so much is because... We are parents to five-year-old Eli and three-year-old Shiloh. And so our world looks a little bit like this. <laughs> They're so cute. Uh, it was important to give you a picture of where I am now because by all accounts, it appears as if I've got it all together. I'm not beholden to anyone or anything except maybe coffee, but that wasn't always the case. I want to give you a little bit of my life history to lay the foundation for what I would really like to unpack, which is how we are disempowered by a victimhood identity when we root our identity in the wrong things. I was born to an English, Irish and Jewish mother and a father with Victorian Aboriginal heritage. My childhood was spent with a single mother who was a heroin addict, stripper and prostitute. This meant that my early years were marred by drugs, serious neglect, physical and sexual abuse. 
When I was 13, my mother actually completed the methadone program. She was the first person in Victoria to do so. But she still drank heavily and smoked marijuana on a daily basis. At that age, at 13, she introduced me to drugs and alcohol. And I would regularly smoke and drink with her. In fact, we got to the point where I'd smoke marijuana with her every night. Despite this, she began writing and she quickly found success as a playwright. I acted in her plays. She was also in a band. She played bass and I played drums. The band was called The Slabets. <laughs> in that time, she showed me how to be a full-time creative and to use the details of my life in my work. However, only three years later, when I was 16, she died of cancer, leaving me on my own without material, financial or emotional support. At this point, I'm going to segue into an artwork I made called Unboxing Bindi. At the time of my mum's death, I packed all of my belongings into a series of boxes, I put them in storage and I left town. The boxes remained unopened for 18 years until 2009 when I made this work, Unboxing Bindi. Even back then, at the beginning of my artistic practice, I was aware that I didn't want to be a victim to anything in life. This is a photo of the installation at Linden Art Gallery in St Kilda. It's centred around a video of myself opening these boxes that I packed when I was 16. And as I do, I shred or destroy most of what I find. My rationale was that my mother's death shredded me, so now I was going to shred it. Some of the things were used to create new artworks. I was taking hidden dark things and transforming them into beautiful things. And it occurred to me that the things in our life that are hard, and traumatic, we often pack into boxes or compartmentalise and store away. Some of those hidden boxes sitting in the dark can take over our lives if we don't deal with them. One of the things I found in the boxes were, was a big bag of all of my childhood much loved soft toys. And in the name of giving away this stuff and not being a victim to it, I hired a giant claw-based skill tester and I put all my childhood soft toys in there and people visiting the exhibition could come and win a soft toy from my childhood. This is a photo of me and my mum just before she died. So back to that story, I was 16, my mum just died and I was on my own. I spent the next three years in a drug-induced haze that included, sorry, the next nine years, I spent the next nine years in a drug-induced haze that included a four-year relationship with a man that dealt drugs, beat and abused me. By my early 20s, I'd travelled to London with uh, 20 bucks in my pocket on my own and began using and dealing drugs there. Within a year of being in London, I was down to 42 kilos. I was overdosing regularly and going into drug-induced psychosis. I knew I was going to die, yet I couldn't stop what I was doing. I tried getting help for myself, but there was none available to me. I remember giving up and giving in to that vicious cycle, and then in the midst of all of that, for the first time in my life, I heard God's voice. It wasn't an audible voice, it was a voice from within and it was relentless and it was repetitive and it said, call out to my son, call out to my son, call out to my son. This is the point at which I get emotional. I never get emotional thinking about my past because I'm no longer wounded by it. It's always about when I remember God's grace, how he reaches into the dark and he pulls us up and out from there. So there I was, I called out to Jesus, I said, I said Jesus, help me. Within days, I was arrested for dealing drugs in nightclubs and locked up. It's not usually the way you would think God would answer. <laughs> Hopefully it's not for you. I was eventually sentenced to four years in a British jail. This is my, my actual ID card from the first prison that I was in in London, which was Holloway Prison. Actually, prison was a transformative place for me. 
within a month of being locked up, I gave my life to Jesus. I began to attend church, read the Bible and pray daily. And for the first time, the actual first time in my life, I knew that I was profoundly and deeply loved. This is a photo of me in prison, more towards the end of my sentence. After two years, I was released on parole and I was deported because I was in England. And so uh, what that looked like was uh, me getting picked up from the prison, escorted to the airport to Heathrow, locked up at Heathrow, uh, and, and then finally escorted onto a plane and sat in a seat before anybody else got onto the plane. That was my first taste of freedom. It was so overwhelming to me that I started to cry. Immediately, the cabin crew came to me and said, Miss Cole, that was my maiden name, we know where you've come from and we know what you've done and we don't want you to be any trouble. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to be any trouble. I just want to go home. People get on the plane. We take off. There's a guy sitting next to me. I'm still crying. Not like ugly tears, just pretty <laughs> tears streaming down my face. And he says to me, <clears throat> are you okay? Okay. And I said, I'm okay, I just want to go home. And he says, well, I've got something that can help you. And he gave me a small handful of Valium, which I took and I put in my back pocket. We get to altitude and he gets up and goes somewhere. And while he's gone, one of the members of the cabin crew come to me and they say, Miss Cole, can you come with us, please? And now I've been in prison for two years, so I've got a prison mentality and I realise, I think... They know I've got the Valium, the contraband, in my back pocket and I'm in trouble for it. They take me to the galley, they stand me there and he says to me, Miss Cole, we can see you're upset and we can see you're not going to be any trouble, so we're going to upgrade you to business class. <laughs> I'm fairly sure I'm the first person that can say I was deported home, upgraded to business class. <laughs> Within a year of being released, I was studying. I finished my studies and I never went back to that extreme lifestyle. But I did stop my pursuit of Jesus. I stopped attending church, reading the Bible and praying. At that time, I was afraid of becoming a Christian. I'd hated and mocked them my whole life and I was ashamed to become one. So I kind of put my encounter with God and my Christianity to one side and I moved forward. I started having exhibitions and I quickly found success. All of my early works explored identity. I was trying to figure out who I was. I'd been on drugs since I was 13 years old and then spent a number of years in prison and I had no idea who I was in the real world without drugs. So I used art as a methodology to explore and unpack my identity. Because I had turned away from Jesus, I tried to find my identity through the lenses of the media and politics, which meant that I placed my significance in the frameworks of identity politics and intersectionality. I made art about those things, and the art world loved it. Now, let's clarify what identity politics and intersectionality means. They are basically the same thing. They are both frameworks for defining a person as affected by a number of discriminations and disadvantages. They claim that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression, their race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, and other identity markers. And they come together to create a complex convergence of oppression that you then form political alliances around. These political alliances formed around oppression are very exclusive as they're underpinned by a belief that no other group could ever possibly empathise sufficiently with them to understand their group. Only one born into that identity or who becomes woke through a kind of revelation truly knows the score. So I'm making art about identity politics, trying to figure out who I am and where I belong and where I can derive my significance from. 
And within five years, my work is at the National Gallery of Victoria, it's on trams, I'm, I'm having national tours of my exhibitions and I'm winning awards. The artistic opportunities are rolling in nationally and globally. And as was mentioned, by 2010, I was named one of Melbourne's top 100 most influential people. I was successful as an artist because I made art that validated social justice warrior, progressive identity politics, victimhood ideals. I quickly became a social justice warrior queen. I was regularly featured in the press. I had the ABC make a documentary on me and I was lauded in the progressive media. I got all the funding I applied for and I was invited to exhibit and speak all over the country. I made quite a few social justice warrior works, but by far my greatest one, <laughs> and one of my earliest ones, was this. When I made this in 2008, I genuinely believed in what I was portraying. My Aboriginal grandmother had taught me to be proud of my Victorian Wadawurrung heritage, and it was the only racial heritage that was ever actively acknowledged to me. This is me and some members of my family, and we're turning ourselves into the stereotypes that we think people want to see. It's kind of amazing that they let me do that to them. I think they regret it now. <laughs> I was genuinely trying to figure out who I was and where I belonged. Can I ask you a question? Do you know what idolatry is? It's directing that inbuilt longing for significance and security towards something of creation instead of the creator. We have made many sacred idols today from creation that people identify with. Things like race, gender, culture, sexual orientation and social background. People form exclusive alliances within these groups which are often founded upon rigid victimhood narratives. And anyone who comes against them from within is excommunicated and, or treated as a blasphemer from without. Our identity will reflect and glorify that which we idolise. If we idolise God, we will reflect him. If we idolise other things, our identity will reflect those things all the while glorifying the self. So back to this image. It got the attention of Andrew Bolt, a conservative commentator from Melbourne who I'm sure you all know. I now know too. <laughs> He began to write about me regularly and he made me the poster child for the opportunistic fair-skinned Aborigine. After two years, I was contacted by a legal firm to ask if I would like to take action against him, which culminated in me testifying in federal court against Andrew and the Herald Sun under a law called the Racial Discrimination Act. The Racial Discrimination Act is a law that limits speech based on offence and humiliation. At the time, I didn't understand that the law we were using had a higher philosophical and political meaning to it. I didn't realise I was entering into a battle about free speech. I just wanted to defend my character. And I didn't have an understanding of a full range of moral and philosophical ideas. So there I was, while I was a social justice warrior queen on the left, I was an opportunistic fair-skinned Aborigine on the right. But that was all about to change. For the first time since my release from prison, while the court case was progressing and I'm experiencing so much success as an artist, I begin to read the Bible again, pray daily and attend church weekly. And it starts to influence my artistic practice. I began using my practice as a way to understand Christianity. And I make work that explores faith, particularly around the conversion experience. That work then gets exhibited at all the big galleries, the NGV, the MCA, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, so on and so forth, all exploring Christian themes. Forgiveness is a huge theme in my work. This work, called I Forgive You, made in 2012, was a response to Kevin Rudd's apology. He said, I'm sorry. I said, I forgive you. 
but it was also a personal expression of what was happening to me at the time as I began to draw closer and closer to Jesus. It's made out of about 25,000 emu feathers. Each letter is about a metre by a metre and it spans 10 metres. It was uh, immediately purchased upon delivery by the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art. When I made it, I sat with my husband, Danny. He, He works with me. We make everything together. And we sat in our garage and day after day, we lovingly, lovingly hand stuck every single feather. And as we did that, Uh, We ate over it and crumbs fell into it and the cat jumped on it and walked over it and slept on it and we finally completed it and then the Gallery of Modern Art from Queensland came, sent people down with their white gloves (laughs) (laughs) and and they came into our garage and they built specially constructed boxes and they shipped it up to Queensland and put it in a climate controlled storage environment. And it reminded me of social media because we present these really pristine, perfect versions of our lives, but really we're all just covered in crumbs and cat fur. (laughs) It's still there today. If only they knew. (laughs) They may now. (laughs) This work is called Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. I made it in 2013. At the time, I was trying to reconcile the tension that had arisen in me between what I'd heard about Aboriginal Christian colonial missions and being a Christian and Aboriginal. Was I, ha- I was trying to reconcile the tension between being both Aboriginal and white, having both white and black heritage, being both the victim and the oppressor. And so I made this, and it says, "'Sometimes I'm ashamed to tell you that I love Jesus.'" Not because I'm ashamed of Jesus, but because I'm ashamed of the evil things people have done in his name. And that's my husband, Danny, standing there. Um, And I put this particular image in because you can see the scale of it. It's four metres high. I've since done my own research on early Christian missions, and I've discovered that I'd bought into some lies. I was told, as an Aboriginal person, that they were solely responsible for the decimation of language and culture in Aboriginal communities here in Victoria. Yet I found that the earliest evidence in this country of English being translated into Aboriginal language was on early Christian missions. And this flies in the face of the idea that they were responsible for the decimation of language and culture. This is a shot of it in a show at the NGV. So I made this work for the National Gallery of Victoria for a particular show there, and I thought, this is my most overtly Christian work, and I was very nervous putting it out there, and I thought it would kill my career. But the day after we delivered it to the NGV, they purchased it, before the show even opened. And it made me realise that this work is very ambiguous. People could read whatever they wanted into it. Most people thought it was actually about the Royal Commission. (laughs) Actually, I do have some works available for purchase on the resource tables out in the foyer. Originally, I thought I might make a poster print of this uh, that you could buy, but I've just brought the opportunity to purchase this part of it. And the reason I did this is because I am no longer ashamed of Jesus. This was a moment in time in my Christian conversion experience. (laughs) Which I needed to go through and reconcile, but now I am not ashamed of the gospel or my identity in Christ at all. So just this crossbeam is available um, out there. I also have two smaller landscapes from a photographic series that I made in 2015 called Babylon. I've seriously reduced the price of these prints just for this conference to make them accessible to everybody. Um, these, both of these landscapes are taken in Western Victoria. And the reason I've wanted to do that is because I think, why should progressives own all the artwork? <laughs> you guys should own it too. <laughs> Our 
And this is kind of my ultimate work on forgiveness. I made it in 2014. It's called We All Need Forgiveness. Uh, and I was taking what I was learning and I was applying it globally. And everybody in this repeats the mantra, I forgive you, over and over and over until a shift occurs. It's a 30-channel video work. It's, it was shown at the NGV. And alongside this, I always install... And that's Danny again. <laughs> Uh, alongside this, I always install a wall where people can write messages of forgiveness. When this was first installed at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, it was for the Sydney Biennale, and across the Biennale, I ended up collecting 25,000 messages of forgiveness. I took some of these messages and I hand dyed them and I used them to create a handmade artist book. This book was commissioned by the National Gallery of Victoria for their inaugural art book fair. I made 20 of these books, each individually numbered, which were sold at the NGV design store. I have six left, they're also out there. And on the surface of it all, it would seem as though making work expressing a sincere Christian faith was acceptable, but it's not. At the time, it was acceptable in the art world because people could still subjectively project their own views onto my work and believe that I was still progressive and finding my significance in the victimhood narratives of identity politics, that I was a progressive Christian. But as I read through the Bible repeatedly and prayed daily, I began to view myself, culture and politics through its lens. And that sparked off a political conversion in me that I wasn't expecting, that was very uncomfortable and lurched me from the regressive left to the conservative right. And then in the midst of all of this personal and spiritual transformation, the judgment for the Racial Discrimination Act court case was handed down. The case against Andrew Bolt and the Herald Sun, we won. He'd been declared a racist. I was a national social justice warrior hero. So it was a big, uncomfortable and annoying surprise to me when in my pursuit of Christianity, I was called to confront all the ways in which I had created myself as the victim. It turns out I was a virtue signaling, social justice warrior who lived in an identity politics victimhood bubble who blamed everyone and everything else for all my problems. I never saw myself as the perpetrator, only as the victim, which is fine when you are a child, but not as an adult. And this perspective led me to feel justified in all of my bad behavior, even though I'd been in prison. This attitude kept me disempowered. I was resentful, angry and bitter. And to top it off, identity politics supported it all with its victimhood hierarchy. It validated it. So many people are being red-pilled from across the Western world for so many reasons. PC culture, intolerance, hypocrisy, Trump derangement syndrome. But for me, becoming a Christian was the driving force behind my political conversion from the regressive left to the conservative right and my emergence from an identity politics victimhood bubble. There is no way that I, of all people, given what I'd been through, could have become free from trying to find my significance in the disempowering victimhood lies of this world without Christianity. It was the only thing that could show me that the identity politics victimhood hierarchy that I had bought into was not a trophy status, but a filthy rag keeping me oppressed and disempowered. True Christianity flips identity politics on its head as it shifts our focus from other people being the perpetrator to us being the wretch or the perpetrator. And it calls us to take account for everything we have ever done. It shows how we, each individual, is fallen and capable of every sort of evil and then forgives us for it. Having been forgiven, who are we to then go and tell other people that they have a debt to be paid to us? And we're going to call it out of them. As Christians, this is the opposite of what we are, got, what we are called to do. We are called to forgive the debt of others, just as, have, just as we have been forgiven. This is so perfectly explained by Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, 
And I, was, I just want to read this story to you. It's the story of the unforgiving debtor because it, it just completely smashes identity politics. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. For some reason this has gone through, but I will... Francis Foster said that identity politics is the most brilliant form of divide and conquer ever created. It pits white against black, gay versus straight, and male versus female. It encourages us not to focus on our humanity, but on the things that are different about us. Movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and the Women's March, with their kitty cat hats, position everyone within those groups as victims allowing them to ignore their part, making them righteous and everyone else the evil perpetrators. It covers over any responsibilities they may have and it completely disempowers. And these narratives are all about calling out the other as one who owes us a debt. That particular person may have never done anything to us, but because they belong to a certain identity group, they are burdened with every single thing that their group has ever done and they must pay for it but you can't repent for something that you haven't done. So you can never be free from that burden. I'm Aboriginal and I'm not a victim. I'm a woman and I'm not a victim. I may have been genuinely victimised in my life, but I will not allow it to define me, disempower me or own me. I forgive all those who have hurt me and I pray blessings over them and I ask God to forgive me for judging them. After all, who am I to judge anyone? I'm capable of the worst things and I've been forgiven. I will not call out the debt in others by positioning myself as righteous and everyone else as not. There is no victim identity in Christianity. You have to take responsibility for everything you've ever done. Even those who are jailed and killed for their faith are told to rejoice. More recently, I embarked on a new artistic project, a series of videos for YouTube that explore the tensions that arose in me due to my Christian and political conversions. In one of the videos, I outline my journey from the regressive left to the conservative right. I talk about my Christian conversion underpinning my political shift and how I've come to understand that identity politics is underpinned by a victimhood status that I no longer want to be defined by. I also mentioned in the video that I was a part of the Andrew Bolt Racial Discrimination Act case and that it was instrumental in opening me up to conservative ideas and to developing an appreciation for the importance of free speech. Well, Andrew Bolt saw that video and he phoned me. And in that way, I came full circle. I apologised to him for taking him to court under the Racial Discrimination Act. I clarified that I may have still taken him to court using defamation laws, 
but that I was deeply regretful at using the Racial Discrimination Act to having, and having him labelled a racist. I don't believe he is a racist at all. He apologised to me as well and invited me onto the Bolt Report, where I spoke about how coming to Christianity unravelled my social justice warrior victimhood identity and gave me an appreciation for, for free speech and conservative values and how regretful I was at playing a huge part in establishing a legal precedence that gives the government an overreach of power when it comes to limiting speech on offence and humiliation. And stepping out in this way has cost me, as we see it costing others. I've lost friends and work through publicly declaring my Christianity and conservatism. As soon as I went on the Bolt Report, I was pulled out of an exhibition and I haven't been invited to be in one since. The art world has gone completely silent on me. And I'm okay with that. My significance is not found in being an artist and I'm no victim to the art world. <laughs> but it does go a little way towards explaining why I have some work here for sale. <laughs> <laughs> I've also started a Patreon page. <laughs> so if anybody feels led to, please join me in, on my Patreon community. I'm making regular videos encouraging Christians in this polarised time, and my family and I would really appreciate the support. I'm willing to pay the price because I believe that it is now my responsibility to publicly step out and tear down the structure that I helped to build. Andrew Bolt was silenced by people being offended at what he said, and now we are seeing others being silenced for sharing Christian doctrine. It's a slippery slope, and it's entirely possible to arrive at a place where just mentioning the name of Jesus will become an, an unlawful offence. Your identity was never meant to be the sum total of a role that you feel or a part that you, were, you play. You were never meant to be defined by what you do, how you look, how much money you have, your gender or your ethnicity. As a society, we are experiencing an epidemic of anxiety, depression, suicide, loneliness and hopelessness. And so much of it has to do with not knowing who you are because you are finding your significance and identity in the wrong things. It's robbing people. It's even robbing Christians. This longing that we have to find significance in our identity is inbuilt. It comes from the fact that our identity does have a source, and that source is God. It creates this longing, a void, and if we don't fill it with God, we will fill it with the wrong things, the idols of this world, wealth, work, social roles, identity politics, victimhood narratives, and intersectionality. The problem with filling your identity with these things is that you are finding your significance in things that are insecure and unstable. They can be torn down at any time, challenged, taken away or fall of their own accord. They've all been tainted by sin. And when that happens, it's a threat to your very core. Who are you without these idols? And that threat to your identity is experienced as anxiety, anger, rage, fear and depression because a loss of that idol constitutes a loss of yourself and your understanding of who you are. So when your identity is under threat, that threat feels so great that any action seems justified without regard for what is right or wrong, just or unjust, moral or immoral, and without any thought of how it's going to affect others. All worldly idols are imperfect. No worldly idol can live up to its divine status. That's not to say that we can't celebrate the things that are different about each of us. I go to a large church, enjoy church, uh, pastored by Shane and Georgie Baxter, and I'm at the West loca location, which is in North Sunshine. We have over 100 nationalities in our congregation. My church is the most multicultural place I know of, and it's the only place I know of where multiculturalism truly works. And the reason it works is that while we celebrate our cultural differences, 
We place our, de- our identity in Christ above them all. And in that, we are unified as one people. It's the most colourful, joyful place I know. People are truly happy. We don't idolise culture, gender, social roles or any other identity markers. We idolise Jesus. We fill our void with him, the only one who will never fail, the only one who is without sin and the only one who will ever live up to our expectations. Humanity was always meant to be defined by who we are in relationship with, which is our heavenly father through Jesus Christ, his child made in his image. Adoption into God's family is the only true solution. And then allowing him to tear down the parts of your life that are founded upon the wrong things and then allowing him to rebuild them firmly upon the foundation of Jesus. And finally, to be unashamed of who you are. My husband and I take every opportunity to share the gospel because there is still a lost and broken generation out there who needs to hear about the undeserved mercy, grace and forgiveness of Jesus. And this grace, forgiveness and mercy is available to everyone, no matter their skin colour, ethnicity, gender or class. Jesus belongs to everyone in every country across the world. I used to be ashamed to identify as a Christian but I am no longer ashamed. I don't need to qualify why I believe. I don't need to apologise for my faith because it's not about me anymore, but those who still need to experience the forgiveness of Jesus. My husband and I have made these wristbands that say, I am not ashamed, with the scripture reference from Romans 1.16 on them. We wear them every day as a reminder of who we are and what we are called to do. He says that they're very hip and stylish. I believe him. They are also available out there. (laughs) Buy them. Wear them to remind yourself that you never need to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, including me, a girl who was so lost in such darkness but now found alive in Christ. So, oh. <laughs> And just to finish up, as part of my recent YouTube series that I encourage you all to go and have a look at on YouTube and share, I took a number of my earlier artworks, such as the blackface portrait, and I turned them into memes poking fun at the identity politics that I was so bound by but now free from. I did this to remake them to reflect who I am now. I've been remade and I wanted to remake my artwork as well. I hope you like them. 